evidence of support that I outlined. Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. We'll turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, the head of Scotland's universities said that there is a growing concern that the students in some schools, particularly in deprived areas, are losing out because of the lack of subject choice. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Uh, I know there is uh, an education committee inquiry into this just now. We'll certainly look at its findings uh, with interest. But broadly speaking, uh, that is not my view. Uh, as Jackson Carlaw will be well aware, under Curriculum for Excellence, there are no uh, set notions about the number of types of qualifications taken at each stage of the senior phase. What matters is the qualifications and awards that pupils leave school with, uh, not just what they study in uh, S4, which is uh, where some of the concerns expressed have been about. And when we look at attainment in our schools, uh, what we are seeing is that at uh, level five, uh, the numbers of pupils leaving with qualifications has risen. The same is true at uh, level six. Uh, the number of pupils going on into positive destinations is also at record levels. And uh, there is now evidence, growing evidence, that the attainment gap between the richest and the poorest is beginning to close. So we will continue to pay close attention to these matters and continue to focus on what needs to be done to ensure that every young person in our schools gets the best possible education. Jackson Carlow. Well, you see, I believe that the breadth of subjects in which students can achieve qualifications does matter. Yep. Yep. And let's just examine what is now emerging. Whereas previously schools would offer around eight subjects in S4, in a majority of cases, that's now reduced to six. Yep. A massive reduction in subjects like modern languages being taken in secondary school, with children in deprived parts of Scotland by far the worst affected. Yeah, yeah. Now, we raised this a year ago with the First Minister, yet from the evidence we've heard this week, her government remains in complete denial. Why? First Minister. Well, again, as I'm sure Jackson Carlaw is aware, the, the general phase of education uh, now goes on uh, to third year, which is uh, longer. There is a broader range of qualifications and other awards now available. And when we look, as I said in my previous answer, if you look at level five qualifications, uh, the percentage of pupils uh, getting a qualification at that level has risen uh, since 2009. Uh, the same is true of qualifications at level six, which uh, is, is broadly speaking uh, higher. Uh, and we're seeing the gap uh, narrowing. Uh, so what we have to judge our education system by is not uh, the, the number of qualifications in one particular year, but what young people are coming yeah. out of school with. We also see uh, record numbers going into university, including record numbers from our deprived areas now going into uh, university. So these are all positive developments, but of course we think there is more work still to be done, uh, which is why we have the programme of reform uh, of education underway. Jackson Carlow. Minister does illustrate in that answer that she is in denial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when our own main education agency was asked just yesterday by how many teachers we are short in each subject, they declared that they didn't know, but that they were looking into it. That brings us to the nub of the problem, because we learned this week three quarters of schools say that a lack of teachers is constraining subject choice to some extent or to a great deal. No matter what spin she puts in it, teacher numbers are down under the SNP, down by 3,100. Isn't it simply the case that if you cut teacher numbers, you restrict the subjects pupils can take? Yeah. First Minister. In terms of teacher vacancies, uh, the number of vacancies and the subjects they're in will vary from time to time, but generally vacancy numbers are down uh, in our schools. In terms of teacher numbers, since I became First Minister, teacher numbers have increased in Scotland uh, by 1,242. Uh, we have the highest number of teachers in our schools now since 2010. We have the highest number of primary school teachers since 1980. Yep. And of course, the recent pay award for teachers uh, will help us recruit and retain teachers even further. In fact, the contribution the Scottish Government has made to that award is specifically geared to do just that. Uh, and in terms of uh, the issue of attainment. Uh, let me just give a bit more detail of uh, my earlier answers. Take qualifications at level five. And I should say we have changed a little bit how these figures are counted. So I'll enter that caveat. But broadly speaking, no, the, where we're able to make a direct comparison. I know they may not want to hear this, but I suggest they listen. Yes. 
In 2006-07, when this government came to office, the percentage of pupils getting a level five qualification or better uh, was just over 71%. Uh, that is now 85.9%. At level six uh, hires, uh, back in 2006, uh, the percentage of pupils getting a level six or better qualification was 41.6%. Last year, that was 62.2%. So these are uh, the facts. We are seeing attainment improve and we are seeing the gap in attainment narrow. That is good progress, but I will be the first to say there is more work to do and we're getting on and doing it. Jackson Carlo. Of course, the achievement of students is to be celebrated, but this question is about the breadth of subjects they can take qualifications in. And First Minister, over, over a thousand people have written to the very inquiry that you've just made reference to, confirming the point I have just made yep. about teacher numbers reducing the availability of subjects in schools. First Minister Gail Gorman, the Chief Inspector of Education, said to this Parliament yesterday that the failure to recruit teachers can, and in some cases does, limit opportunities to lead extensive curriculum improvement. So we know that subject choice in Scottish schools has narrowed significantly under the SNP. Yep. And we know schools say that a lack of teachers, fewer in every single year this government has been in office, is a core reason. A year ago, when we raised this at First Minister's questions, Nicola Sturgeon said she would work hard to ensure young people had a wide choice of subjects to take in secondary school. Yet a year on, we're back here again. She said education would be our number one priority. Isn't it time she acted as if it was our number one priority? First Minister. Acting on it, which is why we're seeing the improvements that I've just cited in the Chamber. Uh, we see more people staying on longer at school. We see more people doing a broader range of subjects over a number of years. That is a good thing. Uh, that is uh, exactly what Curriculum for Excellence is designed uh, to achieve. In terms of uh, teacher numbers, uh, teacher numbers have risen in each of the last three years. Uh, so now, of course, uh, we do have a higher number of teachers than at any time since 2010. And as I said, a higher number of primary school teachers uh, since I was at primary school. Uh, and of course, we are seeing attainment increase. So those are the facts. Now, uh, Jackson Carlaw talks about difficulties around uh, teacher recruitment. That's not something unique uh, to Scotland. Uh, the Education Secretary in England, uh, just in January, yeah. said it's become increasingly difficult to recruit and retain uh, staff. Uh, so this is a challenge for many countries, but it is a challenge this government is addressing by the action we are taking to recruit and retain uh, teachers. And we can see in the exam passes and qualification statistics that I've just cited that our young people are doing better as a result. And I would hope everybody across the chamber, even Jackson Carlaw, would find it within themselves to welcome that. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, yesterday afternoon, the First Minister announced that she does not believe that the Prime Minister is ready to give ground on a Brexit deal. The Labour Party also continues to vehemently oppose a no-deal Brexit. And today we have returned in good faith to make concerted efforts to avoid that no-deal Brexit. But there is no escaping the fact that thanks to Theresa May and the Tories, we are now facing the cliff edge of a no-deal Brexit. So can the First Minister update Parliament and the country on her government's Resilience Committee's plans in the event of a no-deal Brexit next week? First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government Resilience Committee will meet again this afternoon. I will chair that meeting as I have uh, chaired meetings on a weekly basis for some time now. We are planning across the whole range of our responsibilities to ensure that as far as we possibly can, we mitigate the impact of a no-deal Brexit. Uh, I'll be very candid with the Chamber. No matter how much planning uh, or contingency work we do, it will not be possible to mitigate every impact of a no-deal Brexit should that happen, which is why it is so important all of us work to avoid that scenario arising. Uh, yesterday in Westminster, I had firstly a very constructive meeting uh, with Jeremy Corbyn. I also met with the Prime Minister. In the meeting with the Prime Minister, I set out uh, to her again 
the Scottish Government's single market customs union compromise. That's not our first preference, but I said I was willing to look at uh, with the Prime Minister where there may be issues of agreement around that. I also said I was willing and keen to talk to her about how we could allay, for example, our concerns about migration, given the demographic uh, needs of Scotland. Uh, all I really got in return from the Prime Minister was the reasons why she didn't agree with me on these things and why her deal was actually uh, the best one. So she wants to know where the rest of us are prepared to compromise, but I got no sense at all from her at uh, any stage yesterday of where she is willing to compromise. And I, I think uh, from what I read after his meeting with her, Jeremy Corbyn and his colleagues uh, got pretty much the same impression. So if the Prime Minister wants to find a compromise, it's time she started to set out where she is prepared to compromise. And it's also time that everybody across the House of Commons unites behind initiatives like Joanna Cherry's uh, motion earlier this week to make sure we take the risk of a no-deal Brexit away once and for all and forever. Richard Leonard. Um, can I welcome that cooperative tone? And, uh, and, and, but let's focus on something specific. Let's focus on something specific to... Uh, the Scottish situation because last week the chief medical officer and the chief pharmaceutical officer said that steps were being taken to deal with any shortfall of medicines as a result of a no deal Brexit. The health secretary previously stated that the government wanted to have six weeks notice, uh, six weeks worth of medicine in storage on top of normal stock levels by the end of March. Medicines like insulin which over 30,000 people in Scotland rely on every day. So can the First Minister take this opportunity to reassure the public, reassure the public that Scotland now has access to six weeks worth of reserves of all the medicines that we need? First Minister. That is the broad uh, assurance we have from pharmaceutical companies. Of, of course, we continue to work to make sure that information is up to date and that those stockpiles uh, remain, uh, given that, of course, the date for a possible no-deal Brexit has, has changed and may change again. So these plans uh, require to be kept under constant and ongoing review, and I can assure the Chamber uh, that they will be. Obviously, we hope we are not in this situation. The presiding officer has indicated that if we are facing a no-deal Brexit, at, uh, at the end of next week. Parliament will be recalled uh, from recess. I, I welcome uh, that assurance and the government then will have the opportunity to set out uh, up to date, up to the minute uh, date, uh, details of the preparations across uh, a whole range of these issues. Uh, Presiding officer, I couldn't uh, help but notice that while Richard Leonard was asking me that very important and serious yeah. question, the Conservative benches were laughing. Jesus. This is not... This is not a laughing matter. And every Conservative in this chamber and every Conservative politician across the country should be hanging their heads in shame at the fact that they have brought this country to the brink of crisis. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that uh, answer? And, and let me turn to something else which is extremely serious. The Finance Secretary said that Brexit would represent an economic shock on the scale of the 2008 global financial crisis. So in the foreword to his budget, he said, and I can quote him, however, if we face a no deal or cliff edge Brexit, I will have to return to Parliament to reassess our spending priorities. So when will the First Minister bring to this Parliament those revised spending priorities and will she commit to presenting her proposals for consideration by Parliament next week in the event of a recall in the light of a no-deal Brexit possibility. First Minister. Uh, th this is a serious issue. So let me say firstly, I hope the Finance Secretary does not have to return to Parliament with revised budget figures because I hope we don't find ourselves in a no-deal scenario. Uh, if we do find ourselves in that scenario, it will be important that the Finance Secretary does that as quickly as possible. I don't think it would be reasonable to expect that to be uh, next Thursday or Friday, but as soon as possible after that, for full consideration uh, by the Parliament, he would intend uh, to do that. If we are in this scenario, and as I say, let us all hope that that is not the case, there will be a substantial shock to the UK economy and to the Scottish economy 
Within that, we will do whatever we can to mitigate the impacts of, of this. But many of these levers lie in the hands of the UK government. Firstly, uh, many of the levers that would allow us to avoid a no-deal scenario, but also the levers uh, that will require to be pulled if we find ourselves in that situation. I, when I was in London yesterday, also took part in the uh, Cabinet Subcommittee, UK Cabinet Subcommittee uh, on no-deal planning. John Swinney and uh, Mike Russell have attended previous uh, meetings of that subcommittee. One of the issues on the agenda uh, was the UK government's planning for the economic response. And I uh, made the point that I don't think the scale of what they're planning is sufficient uh, to meet the potential scale of the challenge. Uh, so we will continue to do what we can, everything we can, uh, and press the UK government to do likewise. But I, I repeat again, and this is an important, uh, very important point. If we find ourselves uh, leaving the European Union next week or at any stage with no deal, uh, then we will, none of us, be able to properly and fully mitigate the impacts of that, which is why all of us should be focused on doing everything we possibly can to stop that happening. We have a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Liz Smith to be followed by James Kelly. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, first Minister, a constituent uh, contacted me this week to inform me that she's been told by NHS Tayside that she is one of the 300 breast cancer patients who may have received a lower dose of chemotherapy than she should have done for her treatment. This issue was raised in the findings of the recent Healthcare Improvement Scotland report into NHS Tayside, but just as importantly, it was raised in the media almost a year ago. So can I ask why it has taken such a long time to address these concerns and what steps the Scottish Government is taking to investigate the variations in cancer treatments across Scotland? First Minister. Firstly, uh, a whistleblower wrote uh, to the then Health Secretary Shona Robertson in May uh, 2018 uh, about this issue. Shona Robertson uh, immediately uh, arranged uh, for that whistleblower to meet with the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer uh, and in July 2018 the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland to examine the practice of lower dosage of chemotherapy in NHS Tayside and uh, that of course resulted in the publication of that report earlier. Uh, this week. Uh, the findings and the recommendations of the HISH report were considered by an independent expert group to understand any potential impact on Tayside patients arising from the different approach and the group has made clear uh, that any uh, risk of a negative impact to patients is small. A further expert group led by Professor Aileen Keel of the Scottish Cancer Task Force will fully consider all of the HISH recommendations and how they can best be delivered and it expects uh, to report its findings in June, uh, NHS Tayside, of course, has already announced that it will be making changes to its breast, breast cancer chemotherapy treatment to bring them in line with the rest uh, of Scotland. So uh, I hope that gives some assurance on the particular issue. On the broader issue of variation across different health boards, this is something the Scottish Government looks at uh, closely. Uh, for example, a, an atlas of variation often uh, is a way of looking at some of those. And where there is apparent variation, it is then possible to look into whether uh, that uh, is for good reasons or not an action can be taken. And this is uh, an issue we take extremely seriously, as I hope uh, the actions that the then Health Secretary took demonstrate. James Kelly to be followed by Christian Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Workers at the Centrica Call Centre in Glasgow are deeply concerned at the news that 285 jobs are under threat with their site facing closure. The proposed jobs cuts in Glasgow are the thin end of the wedge and will be deeply worrying to workers and their families. Any loss of these jobs would have an adverse effect not only in Glasgow but the wider Scottish economy. I know as a Glasgow MSP, the First Minister will share my concerns about this development, but can I ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government can take to support the workforce in their efforts to ensure that these regressive job cuts do not go ahead? First Minister. Well, I'm grateful to James Kelly for raising an issue. I, I do very much share the concerns he's expressed in the Chamber, and uh, I'm concerned uh, to learn of the developments at British Gas, uh, and my thoughts, of course, are with the employees affected. Uh, Jamie Hepburn, the Business Minister, is pursuing a call with both Centrica and the GMB uh, as soon as it's possible for that to happen. Scottish Enterprise is also establishing contact with the company and uh, will provide whatever support it can. Uh, of course, British Gas is the UK's largest energy supplier. It's a significant employer in Scotland um, and we want to do everything we can to protect uh, jobs within it. So I will ask Jamie Hepburn to ensure uh, that he keeps uh, James Kelly up to date and indeed any other uh, Member of Parliament who has a constituency interest in this matter. And Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, it gives me no pleasure to raise yet again failures on the Borders Railway. 
However, just today there were two peak time cancellations and as a result of overcrowding on later trains, two people fainted, one even requiring medical assistance, and there was also a pregnant woman made ill. Does the First Minister agree with me that for Alec Hind to claim at committee last week customers are already benefiting from improved service delivery, that he needs to get out and about on the borders trains to hear what my constituents think of his improvements? First Minister. Well, I completely agree that this level of uh, discomfort and inconvenience for passengers as a result of overcrowding in no way reflects the service level for which this government and indeed Scottish taxpayers, of course, uh, are paying. Uh, I've been informed that the cancellations today are a consequence of a train that failed early this morning, but I will certainly reinforce to Mr Hines and his colleagues the critical nature of providing a service that passengers can rely on and feel safe and comfortable to use. Uh, improvements across <coughs> ScotRail's services have uh, been patchy, uh, with passengers in the east of the country uh, continuing to be let down by ScotRail. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary met with senior Abellio officials on Monday this week to reinforce the absolute requirement for improvement. I said a couple of weeks ago in this chamber that ScotRail is in the last chance saloon, uh, and I repeat that today. They must meet the commitments contained in the performance remedial agreement that they have now signed up to. And Tom Mason. Thank you. For the First Minister will, will be aware that teacher absences in Aberdeen have been risen by 60% in the last year alone, reaching a total of 2,486 staff days since September 2018. Why does the First Minister think that our teachers are so stressed that they need to be, have so much leave? And what does she plan to do about it? First Minister. Well, we're working hard uh, to reduce unnecessary workload uh, on the part of uh, teachers. We've also just agreed uh, with the teaching unions uh, a pay deal that will significantly increase uh, the pay of teachers and, and the recognition for the job that they do. Uh, obviously, uh, the happy to ask the Education Secretary to speak to the local council about particular, if there are particular issues in that part of the country, but we will continue to take the actions I've already outlined in the Chamber today to ensure that teacher numbers continue uh, to rise and be appropriate to uh, the level of demands that are placed on our teachers. Question number three, Willie Rennie. I want to ask some questions on an area of agreement. Um, I share the First Minister's anxiety that there may be a hasty Brexit agreement between the leader of the Labour Party and the Prime Minister. And because that agreement will not be in the withdrawal agreement, it could be unpicked by Boris Johnson if he takes over from Theresa May later this year. When she met Jeremy Corbyn yesterday, did she get an indication about how he was going to address this issue? And on a people's vote, it seems clear to me that if there is an agreement between the Prime Minister and the leader of the Labour Party, there will be no people's vote. Is that her understanding? First Minister. Well, on the first issue, I am very concerned uh, that a deal may lead to a legally binding withdrawal agreement being passed that would irrevocably take the UK out of the EU on the strength of non-legally binding commitments about the future relationship that could, as Willie Rennie says, be ripped up by a future Prime Minister perish the thought uh, such as Boris uh, Johnson. That is a concern I expressed strongly to Jeremy Corbyn and his colleagues yesterday and uh, you know it's up to him whether he wants to, to listen to me but said uh, if I was in his shoes I would be very very wary uh, about uh, doing a deal on that basis uh, with uh, the Prime Minister. Um, uh, in terms of uh, a people's vote, um, it, it wasn't clear to me from my discussions uh, with Jeremy Corbyn yesterday which way the Labour Party will go on that issue. I, you know, there is obviously a division within the Labour Party, that's fair enough, but I think it is absolutely vital, given the mess that this process has become, that what we don't see is a cobbled together, behind closed doors, least worst compromise cooked up between the Prime Minister and the leader uh, of the opposition. Far better now to uh, request a long extension from the EU to fight the European elections to make that possible, by all means then to allow the Commons to come up with what a compromise might look like, but then ask the people across the UK whether they want to accept a second best compromise or whether actually now, given everything we've learned over the past three years, they might think the best option uh, for the whole of the UK is to remain in the EU. Willie Rennie. I think that's right, because we Remainers are concerned that a deal could be done behind closed doors giving away the real benefits of the European Union without having the people having that final say. I just want to be clear about compromise. She's talked about it today, she talked about it yesterday. She's referred to our 
paper in 2016 that talked about single market membership and also the customs union. It, that was her main position until I charmed her to support the people's vote. <laughs> um, well, she, she did change her mind after I asked her. Um, um, can I have some clarity about what she now means about compromise? Will she insist on a people's vote in all circumstances or is she considering reverting to her original position? First Minister. I would encourage Willie Rennie to keep up with the charm. I think it is much more uh, befitting of his, his status in, the, in this parliament. But um, I want to see a people's vote in all circumstances. I think I've tried to set this out before. This is not a situation of my choosing. It's not a situation of Willie Rennie's choosing. My preference is for Scotland to remain in the EU and I will do everything I can to try to uh, bring that option about. Uh, but if we are faced uh, with that choice no longer at any stage, and I hope this is not the case, with that choice no longer being open uh, to the UK, it will always be open to Scotland down a different route that I continue to hope to charm Willie Rennie into <laughs> agreeing with. But if that option is no longer available to the UK, then I will want to protect Scotland against a hard Brexit. And, and that's why we've put forward previously and indeed voted in the House of Commons on Monday night for a single market customs union uh, compromise. But that is not my preference. So right now, uh, I think those of us who want to see uh, this Brexit mess stopped in its track and the UK given the option uh, of staying in the EU should continue to be fully behind efforts to put this issue back to the people. I think that's the right thing to do now. Indeed, I think it's the most democratic thing to do now. Some further supplementaries. The first from Ruth Maguire to be followed by Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, a study published in the British Medical Journal links the introduction of the HPV vaccine a decade ago with a 90% reduction in cancer causing HPV in Scotland, demonstrating the significant and continued benefits of the vaccination programme. Can the First Minister confirm the Scottish Government's intention to roll out the vaccine to boys? And if so, when will this happen? First Minister. Well, I really welcome uh, this positive report from the British Medical Journal. Um, in Scotland, uptake for the HPV immunisation programme remains high and continues to exceed 80%. And what we saw in that report uh, today is that that is leading to a 90% reduction in the cancer causing HPV in Scotland, which is absolutely uh, remarkable and uh, wonderful. Uh, the Scottish Government remains committed to our efforts to ensure that girls benefit from this vaccine, which, as the study shows, will save lives, is saving lives. Uh, and we want to build on this success and we will extend the HPV HPV vaccine programme to boys later this year. Of course, it remains important, uh, meantime, that women continue to take up the invitation for uh, the regular cervical screening. Uh, smear tests save lives. Uh, it's a unique test as it can prevent the disease before it even uh, begins. Uh, and treatment as a result of screening prevents eight out of 10 cervical cancers from developing. But I hope everybody across uh, the chamber today will welcome the news that the HPV vaccine is already an enormous success story. Alex Rowley to be followed by Jamie Green. Alex Rowley. President officer, it's now clear that Fife has lost out on the £2.8 billion pounds worth of work from the Murray and Kincardine wind farm projects. In fact, it is a fact that as part of that consent for Kincardine, there was commitments given to substantial amounts of work to be done in Scottish yards. What is the First Minister going to do about developers reneging on those commitments to Scottish Yards? And given that the Fife Yards are owned by Scottish Enterprise, what action plan is going to be put in place to ensure that investment comes into the Fife Yards to ensure that they are fit for the future? First Minister. Well, can I thank Alec Rowley for, for raising this issue? I, uh, with the Finance Secretary, met with DF Barnes last week, the uh, owners uh, now of Bifab, and we had the opportunity to discuss uh, their understandable frustrations, frustrations that we share uh, about the recent experience of bidding for uh, some of these contracts. We also discussed issues um, around investment in and infrastructure at the yards, and we were able to assure uh, the company that we will continue to do everything we can to support them, and those discussions are ongoing. Uh, we also discussed, and uh, I know this is an issue that has been uh, raised by Gary Smith and Pat Rafferty, of the union's uh, concerns. Concerned. 
about real concerns uh, about whether or not, uh, and probably not, uh, BIFAB is operating on a level playing field. I think I said when Alec Rowley uh, last raised this issue that we're going to convene a summit to look at some of uh, those issues and try to get to the heart of that because uh, I believe uh, strongly, very, very strongly, uh, that BIFAB uh, should have and indeed does have uh, a bright future if we can resolve some of these issues. And I'm absolutely determined that working with the company, working with the unions, uh, and working with others, we will resolve these issues and make sure this company does have the future it deserves. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've raised the issue of free personal care in this chamber numerous times with the First Minister. Just yesterday, I received correspondence confirming that in North Ayrshire there is a backlog of 100 people uh, waiting for funding. The correspondence from the Health and Social Care Partnership reads, free personal care can only be, be provided within available financial means, but due to budget budgetary pressures, there is a waiting list for funding. Every one of those people are waiting for funding for a solution to meet their needs. First Minister, if free personal care is so universal, then why are so many waiting? First Minister. Well, free personal care is there, uh, has been there for many years for those over 65 who are assessed as, as needing it. Of course, as of Monday this week, it has been extended to those under 65s. Uh, I'm happy to look at the correspondence, have the Health Secretary look at the correspondence if the member wishes to pass it uh, to us. But it is important that we work with integration authorities to make sure that those uh, who are assessed as needing care uh, get it. Of course, uh, I'd say, you know, gently, we would, if we followed uh, the Tory uh, proposals on our budget, of course, we'd have to be uh, taking hundreds of millions of pounds out of the budgets of the health service and integration authorities. Uh, we are increasing the money that's going to the health service. We're increasing money that's going into social care. Uh, and of course, uh, those are proposals for increased funding that the Tories voted against uh, when this parliament considered the budget. And Stuart Stevenson. Um, this week we heard Michelle Ballantyne say, I would be quite happy if the government had nothing to do with the running of the NHS. This is a lady who received her education as a nurse from the NHS, who worked in the NHS. Is it not absolute Tory hypocrisy that she now seeks to undermine the NHS? First Minister. I think the Scottish Conservatives would, are probably starting to wish that Michelle Ballantyne would make fewer interventions in uh, this chamber. But I, I obviously, I was in London yesterday. I wasn't in the chamber. I didn't hear the comments. I have seen them as uh, reported. And I think, uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, the NHS must always uh, stay in public ownership, in public hands, uh, run by the public. And as long as... I or my party have anything to do with it, that will continue to be the case. But I do think Michelle Ballantyne's comments yesterday uh, will uh, underline the concern that many people have that the NHS would not be safe in Conservative hands uh, because they'd want to privatise it at the first opportunity they got. Question number four, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the new Domestic Abuse Act will help reduce violence against women. First Minister. The Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 came into effect on Monday. It creates a specific offence covering not just physical abuse but forms of psychological abuse that were previously difficult to prosecute under existing law. Uh, we know that the vast majority of victims of domestic abuse are women. Uh, Strengthen the law is one part of Equally Safe, our strategy to prevent and eradicate all forms of violence against women and girls. We've worked closely with justice partners to ensure that the justice system is ready for its implementation, including funding Police Scotland to support the development of training for 14,000 police officers and staff. And an extensive public awareness campaign has been launched to raise awareness of the fact that psychological abuse and coercive and controlling behaviour is domestic abuse. Rona Mackay. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Coercive and controlling behaviour has the most damaging and long-lasting effects on individuals. Does the First Minister agree with me that the public awareness campaign will send a clear warning to abusers that all forms of domestic abuse are criminal and that perpetrators shall expect to find the full consequences of their abusive behaviour? First Minister. Uh, yes, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think it's also important that we do have the public awareness campaign to ensure that the public is aware that the law has changed and that victims understand how they can get help. In fact, that victims understand that behaviour of this nature is a crime. I visited with the Justice Secretary, Women's Aid in the East End of Glasgow uh, last week and spoke to two survivors uh, of this 
type of abuse. And they say that for many people suffering this abuse, often the first barrier is making them understand that it is behaviour that is unacceptable. So uh, we must reinforce the message that co coercive and controlling behaviour is domestic abuse and that this new legislation will help to hold perpetrators to account. That public awareness campaign that I've mentioned is running across multiple platforms, television, radio, online uh, and print. Uh, and we're working with a number of third sector groups, uh, Women's Aid, Assist the Shakti Women's Aid uh, and Abuse Men in Scotland uh, to develop this campaign. And again, I hope it's something that all members will get fully behind. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too warmly welcome the new Domestic Abuse Act. However, the management of offenders bill makes it possible for domestic abuse and sexually, uh, sexual offenders who would otherwise be in prison to be released and monitored electronically. And if they then breach exclusion zone conditions, there is a very real danger of something adverse happening very quickly to the domestic abuse victims. How will the First Minister ensure that these breaches will be responded to in real time with the immediacy required to protect these victims? First Minister. Well, we will continue to uh, work very closely with organisations like Women's Aid who represent women who have been uh, the victims of abuse to make sure uh, that as we take forward uh, broader reforms in our justice uh, system, uh, then the needs of those who suffer abuse are absolutely the heart of everything that we uh, do. And in fact, uh, in terms of uh, recent changes uh, or changes in training around the presumption against short sentences, that's a, a discussion that is taking place. Sentencing, of course, is not a matter for government. Sentencing is a matter for courts. Uh, as a result uh, of the new bill, and I think this was amendment uh, introduced by Linda Fabiani, of course, uh, there is uh, now a duty on courts in all domestic abuse cases to consider imposing a non-harassment order to protect the victim and uh, that will enable the criminal court for the first time uh, to use a non-harassment order to protect children as well as the adult victim of the offence. So these are important issues to raise and it's absolutely vital that in all aspects of the justice system we have uh, victims of domestic abuse very much at the heart of everything we do. Question number five, Miles Briggs. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide details of the scope and remit of the Scottish Government's new task force to tackle drug deaths. First Minister. The Public Health Minister will convene an expert group to examine the key drivers of drug deaths and advise on what further changes, either in practice or in the law, could help save lives and reduce harm. As was outlined in the new drug and alcohol strategy a few months ago, we must recognise that there are limitations in relation to public health outcomes associated with the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. Uh, it's also the case, of course, as I think everybody appreciates, that the issue of drug deaths is complex. No one approach, one group or one service can do all that is needed. Uh, so it's important that we make sure everybody is working together. Uh, and the expert group that is being established will also learn from the Dundee uh, and Glasgow work on drug deaths to help inform our continued efforts to tackle this issue. Miles Briggs. Does the First Minister understand the frustration of families across Scotland that it's taken the SNP government so long to wake up to this tragedy across our country? Anna Sawar, Monica Lennon and myself called for this action over the last three years and SNP ministers have failed to act. Now, given the level of concern about drug deaths across our country, can, and how will the First Minister make sure that colleagues across this chamber are part of this task force, that experts and charities many of whom agree with us that it's time we urgently see a new focus on helping people end and not ma just manage their addictions. How will everyone be included to make sure that work's taken forward? First Minister. Well, we will continue to work uh, across uh, the chamber to do the right things in what is a, a complex uh, and challenging issue. I uh, represent a, a constituency, as the member knows, in Glasgow. I, I regularly speak uh, to those who have uh, experience of drug use and uh, families who have been affected by drug use. And uh, those conversations uh, often underline for me, the complexity of this issue, but also some of the, the things that we need to do. Um, and I think it's important, as I said in an exchange uh, a couple of weeks ago with Jackson Carlow, that we are prepared to look not just at some of the traditional uh, actions we take, but at new approaches as well. Uh, the issue of uh, safe consumption facilities is one that is raised regularly in this chamber, which uh, the Tories, in a seemingly knee-jerk way, have just set their face completely against and you know the Home Office actually wrote in a letter to the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership that uh, they acknowledge that there is some evidence for the effectiveness of drug consumption rooms uh, in reducing health risks for drug users. 
So if we're to be serious about this, all of us have to be serious about it. All of us have to have the humility to accept that some things in the past haven't worked and we have to be prepared to have new approaches. But that cuts both ways. If opposition parties want, as I hope they do, to be part of this, then I would again ask the member uh, to rethink this issue uh, and when he has done so, perhaps use any influence he has in the UK government to change their position on this, because changing on the, their position on this would be one way of helping us take these issues forward in a positive way. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the First Minister for her, her comments? Um, she's aware of the clamour for action about this public health crisis. There's a clamour too, uh, First Minister, from people with drug problems to get opiate replacement therapy. The, the figure at the moment is 35% in Scotland, it's 60% in England, and a third of the drug-related deaths in 2014, the individuals had no contact with drug treatment. Some issues, and I, I welcome the, the task force and, and its, its anticipated work, some issues can't wait. Well, the First Minister, as a matter of urgency, addressed an exceptionally low percentage of people with drug problems in treatment and ensure optimum prescribing and support to tackle the unacceptable level of deaths. <clears throat> First Minister. Uh, I am happy to ensure that this is an issue that uh, is looked at. I'm sure this is an issue that, that has been and is being looked at, that it may be uh, something that the expert group wants to look at uh, in the early stages of its work. Obviously, prescribing decisions are for uh, clinicians to take based on uh, the best interests and the needs uh, of those that they're prescribing for. But the uh, disparity that John Finney has uh, just cited there in terms of uh, opiate uh, replacement prescribing rates is certainly something that I think in the, the full scope of this work uh, should be looked at. My, my view on this is that nothing should be off the agenda here. This is a, a serious, complex, challenging issue. Uh, some things that are already being done we know are effective other things are perhaps not effective and there are things that are not currently being done that we have to open our minds to and I think if everybody involved uh, has that spirit then here in Scotland as we have done in so many other public health issues can find a way of leading uh, in the right direction on this and that's what I hope we can achieve. And question six Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that many pregnant women and homeless children are being housed by local authorities in substandard temporary accommodation. First Minister. Uh, temporary accommodation provides an important safety net in emergencies and our end, Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan is very clear that this accommodation must be high quality with stays as short as possible. The vast majority of families with children or pregnant women are given temporary accommodation in the social rented sector. For others, the unsuitable accommodation order provides extra protection to ensure that families don't stay in unsuitable accommodation, for example, bed and breakfast for more than seven days. Uh, breaches of that should not be tolerated and the Housing Minister has already met with councils concerned to discuss uh, solutions. As part of our plans to transform temporary accommodation later this year, we will also consult on extending that protection to all homeless households uh, and the consultation will ask for views on suitable sanctions for any council that fails to comply. Pauline McNeill. <coughs> Thank you. I know that the First Minister talks about high quality temporary accommodation, but all over the country people are being put in smelly, run-down private hotels and bed and breakfast mainly due to a lack of social housing stock at exorbitant cost to the taxpayer. The Herald on Sunday confirmed horror stories of single rooms in grotty hotels with no cooker, no fridge and residents being locked out for being five minutes late in getting to their accommodation. In some cases, there's nothing temporary about some temporary accommodation. I would ask the First Minister if we could focus on what could be done immediately to recognise a scandal. I know there's a lot of ongoing work, but would the First Minister kick into touch the Recommendation 20 of Social Bike Commission's report, which looks at enforcing legally enforceable standards for temporary accommodation, starting with at least the right to a cooker and the right to a fridge? First Minister. Yes, we will consider all uh, recommendations of that nature. As I said in my uh, original answer, one of the things we will uh, consult on uh, are suitable sanctions for councils who are not complying uh, with the, the rules in this area. I think it's important to say uh, that the vast majority uh, of families are in temporary accommodation, are in temporary accommodation in the socially rented sector. Uh, we have that time protection now for uh, families, women uh, with children and, and pregnant women, and that's what we're looking to extend. Um, and breaches of that, in, in part the increase in breaches 
is due to the, the restriction of the, the time limit. Um, but breaches are not acceptable, which is why the Housing Minister has been taking uh, action uh, with the Council's concerned. But the recommendations that came from our task force, uh, we are determined to uh, implement those recommendations so that we transform temporary accommodation, but also, uh, in a broader sense, reduce the circumstances in which anybody has to go into temporary accommodation in the first place. Thank you, and that concludes First Minister's questions. But a point of order first from Mr Stevenson. Um, earlier in questions, uh, Tom Mason raised an issue relating to teachers in Aberdeen. I'm aware, as some others will be, that he is the councillor for Midstocket and Rosemount in Aberdeen. I'm sure it was utterly inadvertent on his part not to draw our attention to that fact. Will you now give him the opportunity to put on the record that he had an interest in the matter he raised? Thank you, Mr Stevenson. That is neither a point of order and, as you will know, is a matter for members' judgment whether or not to declare an interest. That concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on now to members' business in the name of Rachel Hamilton on long-term decline in salmon stocks. But we'll just take a few moments for the member and for ministers to change these. <laughs>